Hello and welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture of Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, these lectures are for students in the IITs and other engineering colleges. The role of humanities and social sciences is quite significant in the curriculum of engineering students. Why literature? We, might, we may ask that uh, why it is so important for the study of engineering. We think that uh, a course on humanities and social sciences sensitizes a student's uh, vocabulary, not only that, an interface between society, between shared individual experiences and ultimately uh, the aesthetic proportions of uh, sharing other experiences and individual thoughts ultimately leads to a different interface of studies. Well, I am Krishna Varua. I have been teaching English uh, at uh, the Department of Humanities and Social Science at IIT Guwahati. And we are presently in the lecture series Language and Literature. And this is module 3 of the series titled History of English Literature. And we are in lecture 4 of this uh, module titled The Augustan Age. The Augustan Age. Let us recap of what we had done in lecture 1. This was where we had gone into the necessity of studying literature for understanding uh, the series of poems and dramas and short stories and essays we brought before you. We want you to be in introduced to the spirit of the age and the ideals of nation's history. Many students ask me, what is this need of the background of understanding the historical significance or the cultural significance or the social significance of the age? I think it is very, very essential. Somewhere or the other, the exchanges which come between one age to the other is essential for your understanding of a, of a text or of a writer. We should enjoy the literary journey of poems, stories and plays and the socio-political milieu uh, from the Victorian era or even as far back as Saucer's times. So, when we uh, went through the first lecture, the Anglo-Saxon literature reveals five striking characteristics. While we are doing the different, different stages of English literature, we will see how there have been convergences and divergences from one age to the other, whether there have been some of the striking features which have been continuing and somewhere there has been a change, especially the, the meaning of freedom, the meaning of expression, the meaning of representation. So, in the Anglo-Saxon literature, we have seen that there was this love of freedom, the love of liberty, reverence for womanhood and most of the poems or literature was alliterative and a ruling motive in every warrior's life, devotion to glory. And in lecture 2, we have gone and that was in lecture 1, we had the age of saucer, the first uh, major uh, uh, father of you can say English poetry, even English novel and the English short story. When we come to the age of Shakespeare, where the, uh, Shakespeare as a person, as a dramatist, as a poet dominates the entire age, we have seen his achievement was largely made possible by the work of his immediate uh, predecessors like Spencer and Sidney in the mastery of verse, Marlowe and the university which especially in drama and then how the, the sage was coming more on the way that concentration of man and the power of human reason to interpret man and nature. And here for the first time we find the dignity of modern English as a literary medium. In lecture 3, we came to Milton and his times and this is where we uh, were quite interesting. It was quite interesting to see how Shakespeare and Milton were the two figures that towered conspicuously till now. Each was representative of his age, one that produced him, one was the force of impulse in Shakespeare and the force of fixed purpose in Milton. 
Now we come to the Augustan age lecture 4 and in English literature the Augustan age roughly from 1700 to 1745 was the neoclassical age the, to bring out the analogy between the first it was a self conscious imitation of the age of Augustus uh, uh, which was supposed to be the classic age Latin literature of the days of Virgil and Horace the classical period of Latin literature. And it also refers to literature with the predominant laws and rules of refinement, where there was attention to detail, to clarity, elegance and balance of judgment, recalling the golden age by examining the enduring truths of human nature. This age in the 18th century we find is also has been termed the age of reason or enlightenment. You have to remember in the, uh, 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 in the European sub in the European continent, we have seen how enlightenment had taken place, especially the Augustan age was the period after the restoration era to, to the death of Alexander Pope. You can come a bit earlier from 1690 to 1744. Enlightenment, what was the enlightened about? Enlightenment about in Europe. It contrasted with the darkness of irrationality and superstition which characterized the middle ages. It was the age of reason, belief in progress and in the power of reason increased and it was a distinctive trait of the period which is also known as the age of reason. Characteristics of this period included observing human nature as well as nature by itself in landscape which were considered unchanging and constant. And the major writers of this period were Pope and John Dryden in poetry, Jonathan Swift, Joseph Edison in prose, to mention only the, the a few. So, we have to go back to the historical background, right. So, three historical events deeply influenced the literary movements of the time. We had just mentioned the restoration of the year 1660, that was the restoration of the monarchy just after the Puritan government fell, I mean Cromwell's government fell and there was this restoration of the uh, monarchy and the Roman Catholic controversy that raised during the latter half of Charles II's reign and the revolution of the year 1688. So, the prior uh, period let us go back the period prior to the Augustan age was the restoration. Okay. So, because Dryden also falls in that period, it will be necessary for us to also talk about the restoration while we are talking about the Augustan age. And uh, after the Augustan age will come romanticism. The English Augustan age spanned 1700 to 1740 with the reign of Queen Anne, King George and King George II. Pope is a dominant figure in this period's poetry. Dryden also is mentioned four times in Pope's essay on criticism. Though Dryden and Pope are classical as neoclassical writers, I do not think they were aware of it during this lifetime. right? So, this restoration in the 18th century, if we look into the general characteristics, if we look into the political spectrum, if we look into the background, which is necessary for you to understand how political developments also added to the uh, the uh, representation in literature. So, begins in 1660 and you remember that during the, uh, the Puritan, uh, during the parliamentary form of government under Cromwell, we found that what had happened that the year in which King Charles the second was restored to the English throne, there was the closing of the theatres and with the reopening of the English theatres closed during Cromwellian spirit and regime and the restoration of the search of England as the national search, we find there was a, a, a play of excesses, especially in drama. Then again, there was another change in the exclusion crisis after the Stuart monarchy, because he uh, King Charles the second did not have any heir. Therefore, there it created modern political parties and the Tories who had first come, who supported the King and the Whigs who opposed him. So, this was the rise of the Whigs and the Tories. It is almost a precursor of the modern system of government in UK. England, Scotland and Wales were united for the first time here by the 1707 Act of Union and 
most important aspect over here, we will go into this later to the rise of the middle classes. Increased importance was placed on the private individual life as is evident in literary forms such as diaries, letters and the novel. Emerging social ideas, people became more responsible A new rhetoric of liberty and rights, sentiment and sympathy. And when we look at 1714 to 1727, just after, after Queen Anne, Queen Anne was succeeded by George I, who was a descendant of the Stuarts. Then during George's reign, transition to the modern system of cabinet government, which we just see now. This laid the foundation for that form of parliamentary monarchy, which has been existent in England ever since. So, the restoration, if we go into that, we see refers to the restoration of the monarchy when Charles II was restored. And of course, this 11 year commonwealth period during which the country was governed by parliament under the direction of the Puritan general um, Oliver Cromwell. Political event coincides with changes in the literary, scientific and cultural life. It was very, very important. So, the, the, the exchanges which were going on and this discourse, this approach that was going on between the parliamentary, between what was happening in the political field, in the social field was equally represented in literature. So, this history or uh, the restoration of Sir II brought about a revolution in English literature. With the collapse of the Puritan government, there sprang up activities that had been so long suppressed that they flew to violent excesses. The commonwealth had insisted on gravity and decorum in all things we had done in the previous lecture that there was always a rule, there was a limit to what one had to say and the restoration encouraged a levity that often became immoral and indecent. Along with much that is sane and powerful, this later tendency is prominent in the writing of the time, especially in the comedies. We find the comedy of manners, uh, especially during this time. Now, if we look into the history of the uh, period, this revolution of 1688. So, this was an event. Why was it important? Which banished the last of the Stuart kings and called William of Orange to the throne, marks the end of a long struggle for political freedom in uh, England. So, now we find modern England was firmly established by the revolution, which was brought about by the excesses of the restoration. Most important, most uh, 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 significant aspect in studying this age was this history of the book. Thereafter, the Englishman spent this tremendous energy, which we have found that there was this cause of liberty, this cause of freedom, which was there, a passion was there in the Elizabethan age, from the Anglo Saxon age to the Puritan age, which his forebears had largely spent in fighting for freedom in endless political discussions and in efforts to improve his government. Okay. So, now we find that there was this social responsibility and political responsibility that one could govern and the question of governance came in. In order to bring about reforms therefore, votes were now necessary and to influence the public opinion therefore, there have to be dissemination of ideas, facts, arguments, information. So, the newspaper was born, the rise of the middle classes, the printing press, everything led to the dissemination of the spread of knowledge and literature in its widest sense including the book, the newspaper, the magazine became the chief instrument of the nation's progress, not to speak of the novel which came just after that. Therefore, when we look into this literature from 1660 to 1785, what do we see? We find that it can be divided into three shorter periods of 40 years uh, each. First period is 1660 to 1700, that of John Dryden, okay, where we have the neoclassical period, where emphasis on decorum or critical principles based on what is elegant, fit and right, the neoclassic age. Then comes 1700 to 1745 deaths of Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope in 1744, another stage where emphasis on satire, more on satire and on wider public leadership. leadership. Then 1700 to 1745, when we look into that, uh, the Augustine era of writers like Swift, Defoe, Pope, Edison still was rich in satire and new prose forms that blended fact and fiction such as news, criminal biographies, travelogues. So, these are new genres of literary representation which came into existence, political allegories and romantic tales. So, therefore, 
early 18th century drama even saw a development of sentimental comedy which we had referred to just now the excesses which were there in the early restoration period in which goodness and high moral sentiments are emphasized and the audience is moved not only to laughter, but also to sympathetic tears. Well, so some of the great figures of the restoration literature from 1600 to 1700 and we find that Dryden, Butler, Wassily, Congreve, Bunyan, Evelyn not in uh, great order, but yes you can get an idea about it. So, who was John Dryden? He was the greater writer of the age voiced the general complaint when he said that in his prose and poetry he was drawing the outlines of a new art, because the passion of the Elizabethans and the, the purpose of, of the Puritan age somewhere did not have any effect upon this new age and he wanted to draw the outlines of a new art, but he moaned that he had no teacher to instruct him. The writers of the age developed two marked tendencies of their own. So, what was this new tendencies? The tendency towards realism, the representation of reality as such and a different style or technique of writing which was in the preciseness, in the austere simplicity and elegance, elegance of expression. So, this new classicism if you note this by the year 1660 Elizabethan romanticism had all but spent itself. John Milton we had seen had still to write paradise lost, but in everything Milton was of the past even at this time. At the restoration he retired and walked in obscurity, he was blind you re remember and his great poem reveals no signs of the time in which his later years were cast. The age which produced Newton's Principia, Milton's Paradise Laws, this is the age 18th century, Dryden's Absalom and Achitable, Purcell's Music and Wren's Searches and all the varied interests and curiosities of the daily life recorded by Evelyn and Pepys, such an age was one of the greatest for English genius and civilization. Many think that the Augustine age was a significant age for uh, for English genius and civilization. It could not have been what it was without the printing press of course granted that, yet it is remarkable what a small amount of printing served its term. In every preceding age we have seen have not we that specially the poetical works which constitute the glory of English literature. Matthew Arnold had already remarked that the glory of an age is, is poetry, but now for the first time we must chronicle the triumph of English prose. A multitude of practical interests arising from the new social and political conditions, we have seen that there was development in the social field, there was development in the political field and there was the age of reason and enlightenment, which led to a new thinking of every man, every man was almost literate you can call that and everyone was aware and that demanded expression not simply in books, but more especially in pamphlets, magazines and newspapers. So, poetry was inadequate for such a task. If we look at the Elizabethan age, we find that the age of Shakespeare, it was where people sang, they did not talk, but here people wrote in prose. And the graceful elegance, if we look into uh, Edison's essays, the terse figure of Swift's satires, even Fielding's novels, the sonorous eloquence of Gibbon's history and Bach's orations this have no parallel in the poetry of the age. Indeed poetry itself became prosaic, we see the reversal of the trend in this respect that it was used not for a creative works of imagination, but for essays, for satire, for criticism and for exactly the same practical ends as was prose. The poetry of the first half of the century as typified in the work of Pope and Dryden is polished and witty enough, but somewhere there is that lack of spontaneity, it lacks fire, enthusiasm, the glow of the Elizabethan age. In a word it interests us as a study of life, yes, rather than delights or inspires us by its appeal to the imagination. So, we concentrate in this age on the prose, the triumph of prose, the variety and excellence of prose works and the development of a serviceable prose style, which had been begun by Dryden. Uh, these are the chief literary glories of the 18th centuries. Therefore, I had referred to it altogether uh, already in the beginning of the lecture that why do we study literature. 
right? And in studying the, the different stages of the development of history of English literature, we find that the whole uh, opening up of our aesthetic, of our intellectual domain or in the way that it had developed uh, through the evolution of ideas which has come in helps us to understand that there has been so many things which has gone into the making of literature of a period. It is not that we forget the past, it is the past which determines the, uh, the present and at the same time we are aware, we are not ignorant of what is happening all around. Maybe this is what was said by T. Uh, uh, S. Eliot when he said that a writer must have the historical sense and when one has the historical sense, one has to be aware of what is going on all around and only then can you write of something or you can represent something which is of your own time and of the uh, people surrounding you. Well, so this was the age of satire. Writers were often found observing nature therefore, in their attempts to express their beliefs. So, satire comes for the first time in English literature. Human nature was considered a constant that observation and reason could be applied to for the advancement of knowledge. Within these circumstances, the age of satire was born, you could analyze yourself, you could laugh at yourself and at the same time you can become a subject of, of observation. So, it became the most popular form of literary tool that was utilized by the writers of the time and with the help of satire, writers were able to educate the public through literature. So, you might ask what is the role of satire and comedy? In comedy too also we have satire, but it is very graceful. The borderline between satire and uh, the, the comedy is thin. At the same time, we find that the purpose is almost where we expose human frailties probably and at the same time we try to redeem the faults which are there. Okay. So, when we come to John Dryden who towers over this age, not as Milton towers over his age or as Shakespeare had towered over uh, over his age and that is why we have termed the, the ages age of Shakespeare or the age of Milton and not the age of Dryden here or the Augustine period, because we have many uh, scholars, many writers who are equally important to discuss. So, Dryden is the greatest literary figure of the restoration and this is a quote from William J. Long and he says that if we can think for a moment of literature as a canal of water, we are talking about a, a literary journey that we are taking, is not it from the beginning to the moderns. We may appreciate the figure that Dryden is the lock by which the waters of English poetry were led down from the mountains of Shakespeare and Milton to the plain of Pope. So, we have gone from the heights to the real, uh, the real pavilions of Pope. That is, he stands between two very different ages and serves as a transition from one to the other. Beautiful quote, this is from William J. Long. So, when we see, look at Dryden, so what do we see? What did he write about? He wrote in every form important to the period. Annus Mirabilis, a narrative poem, All for Love, which was written in blank verse, then um, tragedy, heroic plays, odes, satires, translation of classical work. His Absalom and Achitapal has been undoubtedly the most powerful political satire in the language, in English literature and restoration prose style somehow grew out of this and it became more witty and it became not rural, not pastoral, it became urban, con, uh, confined to the towns, to the cities, to the upper class urban conversation and less like a intricate rhetorical style of previous writers like John Milton and John Donne. Simultaneously, we have found that restoration literature continued to appeal to heroic ideals of love and honor, particularly on sta stage in heroic tragedy. So, the religious question when we come back into this, we find that the strength of the religious political passions of the time is reflected also in the current literature. There was a prevalent suspicion of the Catholics. The famous poem of Dryden, which we have referred to just now, Absalom and Achitabal, is an outstanding example of a kind of poem that abounded during those troubled years. So, it was a critique of the time of what was going on, the conflict between the search and 
governance. At the restoration, the break with the past was almost absolute. Subject and style took on a new spirit and outlook. As Dryden said, I was trying to find out new avenues which will suit the age, a different attitude and aim. Hence, the post restoration period is often set up as the converse and antithesis of the previous Elizabethan stage. If you want to show the dividing line, then you will find that it was the post restoration, it serves as a dividing line between the previous Elizabethan age. It is called classical as opposed to the Elizabethan romanticism. The period which will come just after the Augustan age is also called the romantic age, romanticism, but this romanticism is different from the Elizabethan romanticism. Though the contrast between the two epochs need not be overemphasized, yet the differences are very great. You find striking the similarities and when we see that the first thing that strikes you was the interest in reading and publishing houses, which we have already said that it was not the age of poetry, it was the age of prose. And here the reading and publishing houses they became very, very alert and active and the rising interest in politics witnessed the decline of the drama, it resulted in a remarkable increase in the number of reading public and they became the forerunners of modern public houses, they employed hack writers of the period they lived in miserable hovels in the Grub Street. The rise of the middle class, which is a very, very important sociological dimension to the age of uh, of this period uh, the, to the Augustan age and this period of literature saw the emergence of a powerful middle class and the supremacy of the middle class made it an age of tolerance, moderation and common sense. It sought to refine manners, introduce into life the rule of sweet reasonableness. The industrial revolution was just uh, some time uh, away. The middle class writers were greatly influenced by moral consideration. Therefore, it was an era of assimilation of the aristocracy and the middle class. Middle class tried to bring in the, 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 the all the manners of the aristocracy. They tried not to imitate, but to bring in their own standards of living. So, maybe there was the difference in class, there was a difference in uh, the aristocracy of the middle class. And and the emergence of middle class led to the rise of sentimentalism, feelings and emotions which influenced the literature of the later half of the 18th century. Therefore, the first half of the 18th century was remarkable for the rapid social development in England. While we are doing this age, you must have noted that we are giving more emphasis to the social and the political background more than the literary representation. Of course, the literary representation is coming, but at the same time we cannot ignore what is happening on the surroundings. For the first time they began themselves the task of learning art of living together. Uh, in a single generation nearly 2000 public coffee houses sprang up in London alone. This new social status had a superb effect in polishing men's words and manners. First number of Tatler still announces that activities of his new journal will be based upon the clubs, the coffee clubs. All accounts of gallantly, pleasure, everything shall be under the article of white chocolate house etcetera. Then comes the question of copyright, which we are so much concerned with nowadays. During this reign the law of copyright 1709 was passed and the freedom of the press was restored in 1682 and large numbers of periodicals appeared and flourished in their different fashion. We have Steele who published this Tetler, Spectator, we have Johnson too, he also published other short lived periodicals. Let us see in what respects therefore, this new spirit is shown. Therefore, we find this completely new uh, concentration on something which is different from the other ages. First, we will see the imitation of the ancients, because it was called the Augustan age. Lacking the genius of the Elizabethans, the authors of this period turned to the greatest classical writers and that was in the beginning to the Latin writers for guidance and inspiration and as uh, we have seen uh, during the time of Dryden deepened and hardened during the succeeding era of Pope. So much so that the latter laid down as a final test of excellence, Pope had said that imitation of the ancient learn hence for ancient rules, a just esteem to copy nature is to copy them. Though Dryden and Pope are classified as neoclassical writers and about nature in neoclassicism is returning to the classics. Aside from Dryden, Pope also comments Aristotle, Homer, Horace etcetera. Now, imitation of friends, especially in the comedies. Charles Sand has spent most of his 
years in exile in France, naturally he will bring in the influences of the French court. In particular, the effects of this penetrated very deeply into the drama of French comedy. Moliere was the outstanding exponent and his influence was very great. Development of the literary forms therefore, viewed as a whole this period is seen to be one of transition, is not it. So, the Elizabethan power had spent itself, new classicism was still in the making, yet the time is important in the development of literary new literary forms. Political and social changes exhibiting the supremacy of good change, rationality uh, on the literature of days of Pace, uh, Pope and Dr. Johnson. And why it is called age of proofs and reason, we have to see not because not of poetry, because a large number of practical interests arising from new social and political conditions demanded expression not simply in books, but in pamphlets, magazines and, uh, mag and newspapers. The poetry of the first half of the 18th century was represented by the works of Pope and uh, polished and witty, but lacks fire filling. Matthew Arnold rightly calls 18th century the age of prose. Well, when we had talked about satire, then we will see that the predominance of satire is an important literary characteristic of the age. Nearly every writer of the first half of the 18th century was used and rewarded by the two parties, the Whigs and the Tories for satirizing their enemies and they were employed by these two different groups and Pope was an exception, but he too was a satirist par excellence and W. J. Long writes, now satire that is a literary work which searches out the faults of men or institution in order to hold them up to ridicule is at best a destructive type of criticism. So, where it had a negative uh, dimension to it. So, restoration literary movement when we go back to the restoration having its impact upon the Augustine age, we find were extremely varied with philosophical, political or sexual elements. Pastoral literature somewhere or the other was present during the restoration, but the Augustine age focuses not on country life. The school of nature poetry uses a contrary definition of nature to popes and this wild and grand. Then poetry we find the lyric shows little change in bulk it is inconsiderable for the lyrical spirit is largely abeyance in abeyance. Outside Dryden who is the best of lyrical poets, we have this slight work of the courtiers the Earl of Dorset and uh, Sir Sedley and the Earl of Rochester. Epic poetry, we come into epic poetry how it was uh, somehow a limitation long narrative poems on heroic subjects mark the best work of classical Greek. And, uh, we have seen how uh, later in Paradise Law, John Dryden also wrote epic poetry, but on classical and biblical poems. And the comic parody of the epic poem, we have the mock heroic as we have found in um, uh, Dryden, where he experimented with that and the best example is Pope's The Rape of the Lock. Though, through, though Dryden's work is still read today, it leads to the best poetry of the mid 18th century is the comic writing of Alexander Pope and Pope is the best regarded comic writer and satirist of English poetry among his many masterpieces. The mock heroic is the rape of the lock. The ode once more Dryden Tower is very eminent in this class of poem. His two odes on the anniversary, anniversary of Saint Cecilia's day and his other ode on the death of Mrs. Annie Killigrew are among the best of any period. And we have already done that drama therefore, we will have to see how from the sentimental comedy that tragedy and to the to the heroic play. So, tragedy the most novel in the meta form is the heroic play, the tragical faculty is weakening all through the period even in comparison with the post Shakespearean plays. Other major dramatic genre was the restoration, it was a very significant mark, comedy of manners, which emphasizes sexual intrigue and satirizes the elite's social behavior with very, very witty dialogue. So, it was the dialogue which was the center uh, stage of this of this place. Comedy of humors was also dying out, though considerable traces of it Johnson's Ben Johnson's comedy of humors was still visible and was replaced by the comedy of manners. So, restoration comedy when we look into it were no longer prohibited on the death of Oliver Cromwell, a new kind of uh, comic drama which dealt with issues of sexual politics among the wealthy and the bourgeois arose and this is restoration comedy. Uh, 
and many lack merit many say, but the best drama uses the restoration convention for a serious exam examination of contemporary morality. A play which exemplifies this well is the country wife by William William Wesley. And theatre in England during the 18th century therefore, was dominated by the actor David Garrick. His performances had a tremendous impact on the art of acting from which ultimately grew movements such as realism and naturalism. Of course, there were plays which dealt with ordinary people as characters such as in Stoops to Conquer by Oliver Goldsmith, then we have the School for Scandal by Richard Sheridan, the growing desire for freedom both in Europe and North America. It was also in the 18th century that commercial theatre began to make its appearance in the colonies of North America. Well, in prose therefore, when we say that it is the triumph of prose in this age, with the exception of the work of Dryden and Bunyan, the prose work of the time was of little moment even then. Dryden's prose is almost entirely devoted to literary criticism. Bunyan's contribution shows a remarkable development of the prose allegory. And Samuel Johnson and his literary and intellectual circle, when we come to the prose work, we find that he had the greatest early novels of the English language comes in, research sons Clarissa and Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. This was in 1749. By the year 1700, during the reigns of Sir II, the term weak part stood for the preeminence of personal freedom as opposed to the Hanoverian succession, whereas the Tories were Jacobites. So, this age was also the age of literary patronage, the age of journalism and periodical essay. When we look at the essay in our lecture on genres, we had done that, that the Tetler and the Spectator, the names which shine very, very prominently are those of Joseph Edison and Richard Still and how the breezy conversational style or the journalistic prose of our times was go, went back to these days, to these efforts. When we look into the history, the rise of the political parties, therefore, as we have seen that the Whig and the Tory first became current and domestic affairs were also uh, somehow influencing the representation of the time. And after the succession of the house of Hanover, the first half of the 18th century was a period of stabilization and steadily growing wealth and prosperity. Their new classical style employed Roman forms such as the ode as we have seen and emphasized over emotion and elegance over brevity. And when we come to Alexander Pope from 1688 to 1744, we can see Pope's work into three groups corresponding to the early middle and later period of his life. The first part are the pastorals, the second is the translations of Homer and third is the Dunciad and the epistles and the letter containing the famous essay on man and the epistle to the Dr. Arbuthnot. So, the literature of this period which conformed to Pope's aesthetic principles, I had remarked that this was the growing of the aesthetic principles which was coming into literature and could thus qualify as being Augustine is distinguished by striving for harmony of form and precision. So, it was a different form of aesthetics, a different form of technique which they were looking at. So, it became literature became a tool of representation and its urbanity and its imitation of classical models such as Homer, Cicero, Virgil and Horace. So, when we come after Pope, the emergence of new literary themes and more, we see that with the death of Samuel Johnson in 1784, novelists became better known than poets and intellectual prose forms such as the essay proliferated. Be the 18th century is often referred to as the age of Johnson too. After the renowned essay Samuel Johnson, who in 1755 wrote one of the first English dictionaries to define word meaning. So, the first English dictionary is attributed to him by employing quotation taken from the best English writers past and present. And also by the 1740s, the novel rose to dominate the literary marketplace with writers like Henry Fielding, Samuel Richardson, Lawrence Stern defining the form and its mode of representing the private lives of individual. individual. So, mind you, while we, we are doing these forms, what do you think of literature as representation or literature as imitation? 
you must be going through so many different ways of reading a text of interpreting a text. And when we look into it, we sometimes think that literature has different different dimensions of understanding an individual or society. And these writers in different ways were occupied, preoccupied or with form, with the way of representation, with the way of how literature can be written. Right? And therefore, I feel that you as students of uh, technical field also will understand the importance of form, the importance of where system takes in, in writing something which is of imagination maybe, but ultimately it leads to a technique in representation. So, when we come to Samuel Johnson, what did he say? A book says Dr. Johnson should help us either to enjoy life or to endure it. So, the question of aesthetic pleasure or delight is something which we must take into consideration when we study language and literature, right. And it is somewhere another dimension, another perspective in which we understand literature. Judged by this standard, one is puzzled what to recommend among Johnson's numerous books. We have seen are his dictionary, his lives of the poets, which were almost like biographies of all the leading uh, writers of the time. He was also called the greatest essayist of all time, especially through the Tatler and the Spectator, and where colloquial English language of the people was shown and also written in elevated prose. With Johnson, who succeeded Dryden and Pope in the safe place of English letters, the classic movement had largely spent its form. So, now we can see that how it had taken its form through the different periods, through the different writers. And the later half of the 18th century gives us an imposing array of writers who differ so widely that it is almost impossible to classify them. In general, three schools of writers are noticeable. First, the classicist just after Johnson, under Johnson's lead. Second, the romantic poets. So, the pre-romantics like Collins, Gray, Thompson and Burns, who were the precursors of romanticism and also the early novelists like Defoe and Fielding, who introduced a new type of literature. So, when we come into da Daniel Defoe, right, we can see that the, he shows the account of a historian. It is almost as if he is uh, documenting what is going on around him. When a survey is demanded of Queen Anne's England and his everyday life, our thoughts always turn to Daniel Defoe, riding solitary and observant through the countryside. This is what Trevelyan had said in the social history of English literature. He first perfected the art of the reporter and you have to see it was not Edison and still, but it was Daniel Defoe who could report on what he had seen and put it into literature. Even his novels such as Robinson Crusoe and Maul Fernandez are imaginary reports of daily life, whether on a desert island or in a thief's den. For Defoe was one of the first who saw the old world to a pair of sub modern eyes. So, the first modern you can term him. Who was the first novelist therefore? If we can say that it was Spanish Cervantes and the very English Daniel Defoe, so both of them can occupy the same position. Verily, the novel became the dominant form of creative literature in the mid 18th century. Daniel Defoe and his novel Robinson Crusoe in 1719 and later Maul Flanders 1722. The reading public has increased and you see that it was something that he had a great uh, uh, followers. Then comes Samuel Richardson's Pamela, published in 1740, supposed to be the first major novel, Henry Fielding, where characters became prominent and essential quality uh, to the novel appeared, the Bildung's Roman or whatever you can call it, how a character de develops in the process of the whole novel. And the rise of the novel in the 18th century, written by Defoe, Richardson and Fielding was partly due to its milieu and particularly the changing political, social, economic shifts as a result of the industrial revolution. Granted this, you have to grant that it was the milieu which ultimately gave place to the rise of the novel. So, the industrial revolution from 1750 to 1850 became the dominant form of creative literature even in the mid 19th century. When we go to romantic age, we will find that it was apart from poetry, it was also one of the more dominant uh, genres. Though neoclassism was spread in the English Augustan period, 
There was other movements during that period. What was coming around after Johnson? There was the graveyard poets had a melancholy tone. Both movements presupposed the oncoming romanticism literary movement. Serious poetry of the period is well represented by the neoclassical Thomas Gray from 1716 to 1771, whose elegy written in a country such as this is a poem I think each one of you should read and it is an excellent poem and a classic poem virtually perfects the elegant style favored at that time. Some critics also placed the end of the 18th century at 1776 linking it to the American revolution, others and 1789, the beginning of the French revolution, still others in 1798, the publication of Wordsworth and Coleridge lyrical ballads. So, you have to note these landmarks, you have to note these times, okay, whether it was the French revolution or it was the American revolution or the publication of Wordsworth and Coleridge lyrical ballads, because it throws a link or it shows the dividing line between one age and the other. So, this transition between the Augustan period and the romantic period was a drastic shift in literary ideals. The Augustans followed the works of former classical writers we have seen such as Horace, Virgil and Homer, their attention to detail, their attention to rules, their attention to perfection and elegance of prose, where everything was somehow un went under great scrutiny, everything was not just spontaneous uh, imagination or spontaneous uh, overflow of feelings. To them, this was the proper and only way to write. They followed the views of Aristotle, which led them to an empirical way of teaching. So, therefore, some characteristics of Augustine poetry are the concept of individualism versus society, the imitation of the classics, if you look into that, politics and social issues, which are equally important, satire and irony, irony there is a, uh, that is uh, a way that rhetoric and prosody comes into form, empiricism and comedy. So, let us sum up the social and historical aspects of restoration period. Do, you have seen the rise of neoclassicism, imitations of the ancient masters and the impact on the writings of the restoration age. You can say it was a conscious imitation of the classics and introduction of correctness and appropriateness as well as formalism and realism in their writing. So, when we talk about the imitation, the conscious imitation of the classics, then we know that it was a self conscious imitation and somewhere that national character of the literature was lost, flawed some way it was at uh, a way of imitation, which gave a hurdle, uh, placed a hurdle to representation. It also speaks of the prose and verse of the age. The emphasis is placed on the dramatic activities of restoration age, especially the birth of new tragedy called the heroic tragedy and comedy called the comedy of manners on the decline and decay of drama during restoration age. The political time therefore, the reign of Queen Anne in early 18th century England uh, was called the uh, Augustan age and the style in motion employed Roman forms such as ode, emphasized common sense, moderation, the transitional period from rapid social development in England. They themselves began the task of learning art of living together, the emancipation of the political parties by the year 1700 the term weak party stood for preeminence of personal freedom as opposed to the have no uh, 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 succession, the spirit of the age, the clubs and the coffee houses, periodicals and publishing houses, the new morality. So, the transition between the Augustan period and the romantic period was a drastic shift in literary ideals. We will see in the next uh, lecture the Augustans followed the works of former classical writers. To them, this was the proper and only way to write. They followed the views of Aristotle and therefore, we have to see how we look into this age and how it became the precursor of the next age. So, in the discussion, let us see. Describe briefly the social development of the 18th century. What effect did this have on literature? What accounts for the prevalence of prose? Why was it that prose became the the hallmark of that age. What influence did the first newspapers exert on life and literature? How do the readers of this age compare with those of the age of Elizabeth? And when you do the different stages of uh, English history, 
uh, especially the history of English literature, you will have to see the different genres that had become very prominent during these ages. How do you explain the fact that satire was largely based in both prose and poetry? Name the principal satires of the age, whether it was in drama, whether it was in poetry or whether it was in prose. What is the meaning of the term classicism as applied to the literature of this age? Did the classicism of Johnson for instance have any relation to classic literature in its true sense? You have to go and explore how the classic literature of the Latin period of the page of, of the period of Augustus okay, had the same elements of decorum or elegance of prose or the system of, of writing. Why is this period called the Augustan age? Why was Shakespeare not regarded by this age as a classical writer? In what respect is Pope a unique writer? How does he reflect the critical spirit of his age in different ways, whether it is in his poetry or in his uh, prose? What are the chief characteristics of his poetry? What great work did Edison and still do for literature? So, they were the beginners of the initiators of the, of, of, of the journals of the essays. How is their work a preparation for the novel? For what is Dr. Johnson famous in literature? Can you explain his great influence? You know? Not only was he a uh, hallmark, you can call him a pioneer, an icon in, in biography, but also in the way that he was uh, the first who had brought out the dictionary. What is meant by the modern novel? How does it differ from the early romances and from the adventure story? Refer text, especially if you want to look into uh, any history of English literature, one text that you will find very, very uh, helpful for you, especially for engineering students is Edward Elwood's History of English Literature and William J. Long's English Literature is History and Significance. If you want to see the English social history, then read G. M. Travelings, then A. W. Ward's Cambridge History of English Literature, David Dices, which is a must for every student of English Literature, but you can also go through that Critical History of English Literature, which is in four volumes and Margaret Drebel and Robert Soule's Elements of Literature, where you see how literature is to be enjoyed and how you can give more time to understanding different texts. Thank you.